for those of you who are devotees of PowerPoint, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, I took it off my computer 10 years ago as an enemy of learning. So no PowerPoint, no slides. Microsoft will pay me not to say that. But I earn more money just by going around not saying that than just doing anything else. But, so it's just going to be you and me. You can save your questions to the end, but if you really want to say something, I have a question, just do it. You're not interrupting anything. It's all in my head. I have to scroll back to where I was. So if you really have a comment or something really feel like burning interest, but just want to say just do it. You really have to play it open to that. You're not interrupting anything. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the future of knowledge. It's a talk I've been working on in, uh, for the last year or so, and I could have formed the base of a book on it. That's the best advice I'm going to give you. Don't get older. There's almost nothing in it. Uh, forget about all this knowledge stuff. Just don't get older. Thanks. Let me start with, uh, I'm going to start by telling you a story, uh, how I got involved in this whole subject. Uh, it, the story illustrates quite a few of the points that we're going to be making during the talk. And uh, it's also useful to start with a story since that's all anyone ever remembers is stories. This is really true. The only thing you ever remember is stories. All the other stuff you hear, it just, maybe you can remember it short term if you're young, but stories stay with you your whole life. This huge now research on narratology. In fact, a friend of mine just wrote a book called On the Origin of Stories, the correspondent Darwin's On the Origin of Species. He really shows that that's how we're wired. I'll come back to that later. So let me tell you your story. Jesse, advantage of being true. How I got interested in this subject. It's not a subject anyone else ever got interested. When I was a boy, my, uh, I had a grandfather who's, I'm from New York City, but those of you who are linguistically challenged. <laughs> I had a grandfather who did, he, he was still alive when I was 10, 11, 12. Uh, big, gruff old fellow, and he unfortunately didn't speak English, so I couldn't really talk to him. But I was curious about him. He seemed friendly towards me, but he looked a little like me, but I couldn't speak to him, and he was kind of a gruff guy. So I'd ask my father questions about his father, the term of And it turned out this man had been an officer in the Russian army under the Tsar. Very odd that I would have such an ancestor, but it's nonetheless true. And he had fought in the war in 1905 that Russia very foolishly engaged with Japan, called the Russia-Japanese War. At the end of that war, when Russia got whipped, he uh, left and came to the United States with my infant father. And sisters and brothers. Well, I, I had a very strong interest in history at the time, 12, 13, I really got it. And I kept thinking about this, because you know, you have a relative who fought in the war too, but interesting. In World War II, I had quite a few relatives who fought in the Second World War, but that was common stuff, a lot of people did. Having this obscure war, which I barely, I, kn I didn't know anyone who knew anything about it, I had to look it up in the library. And I began to wonder, I had a map of the world in my room, a big map of the world, and I looked at Russia, this is pre-1989 Russia, and it's a hell of a big country. Remember what Russia used to look like? It was big. I looked at Japan. It's a string of islands off the shore of Russia. It's odd that they could beat them. And then I noticed that the Russians I knew in New York City, people who have Russian ancestry, were big. My grandfather was six foot seven. Big, they were big people, the Russians, right? Well, the Japanese that I saw in New York, to put it mildly, were not big. They were small guys. So when you're a 12-year-old boy, you measure things that way. So these little people beat the big people. There's more of the big people than the little people, and they have an enormous country. How did this happen? I really began to question in this. And I asked my father, he's my father. My father had only, was only interested in sports. And all he would talk to me about sports, I couldn't care less about sports, so I had a tough childhood. But he wasn't interested in explaining to me anything else. There was no one in the neighborhood I could ask. This was a working class neighborhood in New York City. No one knew. They thought I was crazy. And I couldn't really look it up. So for years, I'm quite sure, it would stay in my mind. How did that happen? And I couldn't ask my grandfather, who probably could have told me, but he couldn't speak any English at all. There used to be people that come to the U.S., they didn't have to learn English because there was enough of them to form a critical mass. They just lived with each other and never learned. They're just lazy. 
Greeks, Jews, you name it, Chinese people. Now it would be different now, but it, so I got to college and I did major in history. I got very interested. And one day, my second year at university, I took a class in Japanese history, modern Japanese history. And I did learn what happened. And what happened is very relevant for what we're going to be talking about here. Japan, in about 1850, 1860, was watching the rest of Asia get eaten, eaten by the Western powers in the US. Germany, the U England, France, even little parts of Italy were slowly taking apart China, taking apart Southeast Asia, and the Japanese knew they would be next. They just knew this. So when Admiral Perry, an American admiral, sent a fleet in to Tokyo Harbor to open up Japan, really, to, we, you're going to trade with us or we're going to kill you, the Japanese had a fast choice. They could give in, they could fight, but they took a third road, a road that was for the first time in history taken. They said, we're going to learn what they learned and beat them at their own game. <clears throat> it's called the Meiji Restoration in Japanese history. They sent people out throughout the world. They sent their own professors, their own bureaucrats to Germany, to the UK, to the US to learn weaponry, ordnance, fighting mechanisms, how to organize yourself. This was a feudal society, a society still based on, you know, you, know, you watch those movies. <laughs> watch a samurai movie. They was based on feudalism. It wouldn't, it wouldn't look that different than 14th century England or Ireland. They transformed themselves in 30 years into a powerful industrial nation by appropriating knowledge from around the world, bringing it in, adapting it. This is an astounding story. Rather than giving up, fighting with their swords, I mean, all sorts of alternatives that would have gotten them nowhere, they did the one thing that absolutely made sense, and it worked. They beat the Russians. That was the first time in history that an Asian country beat a, quote, Western country. The Russians, run by complete morons, had, were fighting with wep they were fighting with rifles they had bought from the American Civil Army that was used in the American Civil War 70 years earlier. Americans offloaded all these rifles from the 1860s that the Russians used in 1905. The Japanese had modern German machine guns. Took them out. There was not even a band. The, the Navy, the Japanese Navy was as good as any Navy in the world. They built perfect models of German ships and US ships and blew the Russians out of the water. It's a story about knowledge. It's a story about global knowledge, using knowledge. I didn't know it at the time. No one used the word knowledge then. But it stuck with me. It was an interesting story. It was sort of connected to it. And as I got involved in these subjects, I would often refer to it. So that's sort of how I planted an early seed in my head about how I got interested. Maybe that's what makes the world go round. Maybe it's not money necessarily or physical power. Maybe it's who knows what. How do they know it? How do they use things? If I were um, considerably younger, I would write a history of the world from a knowledge perspective. No one's ever done that, but it will be done and it should be done. It won't be done by me, but it should and could be done. So let's talk a little, having said that. <coughs> if we agree with the premise that knowledge is a pretty important thing, what's going on in knowledge today you know, that would help you, that you might find interesting? Well, there are two giant macro events. If you were looking at the year 2009 from the year 2509, so it's 500 years from now, it's called counterfactual history, 500 years from now, and you're writing a history of this year. You know, you're writing a textbook. If they, no one will be reading them, you know, it's all, you take a pill or something. But make, imagine things like that. And you're writing, what would be the biggest thing? You only had one page to write about 2009 or 2010. You know, these textbooks. What, what would you say? What, what would be the most important from the world's point? Because oh, people only write global history by then. I mean, believe me, anything else will just be peripheral. What would you say? What's going on in the world today that's important? What two events? Intent. Pardon? Intent. Intent. That's the biggest issue, I think. You think so? Yeah. Interesting. What are the rest of it? Technological? No, What else? Yeah. yeah. Well, interesting. It's an interesting subject, isn't it? 
Now it's possible climate change, there won't be anything in two, you know, two, 500 years from now, so that we were all wrong. Uh, I don't know enough, and you didn't ask me to speak about that, but it's possible that's the biggest event, because none of us want to think much about it, just to press the hell out of all of us and just go home. But barring that, let me put forth two things I would use. Yes. Ah, uh, the first three words are right. The break up of the monopoly of knowledge by the West. That's exactly right. For the last 150 years, three areas in the world have a monopoly on useful knowledge, the development of useful knowledge, three areas. The United States, Western Europe, and Japan. They had the monopoly on the development and the applications of what I call useful knowledge. So I'm not talking about poetry or literature or musical philosophy. That's cut across the world. You can never say, you know, one, one's better than the other. It'd be ridiculous. But useful knowledge, science, and soft and hard technologies. So not only hard technologies, but how to organize to do something, a soft technology. That was a monopoly. It was a, an unnatural state. It came about unnaturally. In the year 1500, Japan, excuse me, in, India and China were co-equal with all of Europe. So it came about through all sorts of reasons we can't go into here, the development of industrialism, the breakup of one religion in Europe, offshoots. Max Weber wrote about this. There's a lot of things you can read about it. But this began to break up in about 1970, and it's an enormous story. Because during that period of monopolization, anything you made would be bought by your internal markets. There was no competition. We made some of the worst products in the world in the United States, and the internal market took them. And whatever we couldn't sell in the US, we just sent it here. We sent it to Europe. Absolute junk. When there's no comp that's what anything, when there's no com competition, doesn't matter. Cars, I mean, look. The demise of General Motors and the rise of Toyota is an interesting example of what I'm talking about. So about 1970, 1975, knowledge seeped out. It, got, it lost its monopoly flavor. All sorts of places began to figure out how to do things, have the institutions that allowed them to do it, universities, government departments, attitudes of people. In 1968, I actually, um, there was a war going, one of America's periodic wars were going on, and I managed to, uh, I didn't have to fight in it. And I went around the world I, with a couple of friends. We had very little money, so we just traveled. <coughs> and I visited, among other places, Malaysia, 1968. You know what Malaysia was like in 1968? It made Ireland look like Seoul, Korea. It was a malarial swamp of British rubber I don't know how to, barons, I don't even know how to put that. The, Brit the Brits ran it as rubber plantations. The Malays, the Chinese were the merchants. They'd sell shirts and clothing. And the native Malays were like, they were like serfs. That's probably the best word. But it was nowhere. You would never in a million years think this was going to be anything else than a place that had no future. And have you been to KL lately? Anyone in this room been to Kuala Lumpur? What's it like? Tell them. It's very hot, for sure. That doesn't change. Very hot. But a high-rise, dynamic economy. People are moving around. There are countries. It's, what happened? They learn how to do something. They appropriate for all sorts of evolutionary reasons, technical reasons, political. They learn how to make technology equipment and how to teach people how to do it. If you, when you say they. They, right. Who is the they? they? I'd say the leadership, the government, the leadership of the universities, and the desire of those people, at least a fair amount of them, who said, we're sick of this life. We're sick of bought, squeezing rubber plants for the Brits. If you own a laptop computer, someone in Malaysia did something to it. It's true. So that's true of Malaysia. Go to Vietnam, Ireland itself, in your own country. It got, got away. In the southern India and China, of course. The three, three firms I've had things to do with, three of the most intellectually interesting firms in the world, in the last two years opened giant R&D centers in China. This is McKinsey, Google, and Goldman Sachs. A lot of brain power. McKinsey, all opened large R&D centers in China. 
Do you think that would have happened 50 years ago, 100 years ago? Irregardless of politics, whether it was communist or not, there weren't enough people to staff them. They just wouldn't work. It would be a, 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 an odd act of gratuitous public relations. But they're doing it now because they feel there's enough people there to really make it go, make it go well. What does this mean for knowledge? What does it mean for you? It means there are more players making more things. It's harder to know things because more people know them. So to know something new is doubly hard, triply hard, quadruply hard. Everyone does things. I have a cousin who got a PhD in organic chemistry. He's my age, so he got it 40 years ago. And I just I had dinner with him not long ago, and I said, um, he told me he's supervising some current PhDs in organic chemistry. He says, you know, it's infinitely harder for them because I could master organic chemistry 40 years ago. You only had to know one or two, you know, two or three languages, and you can encompass the subject. You could really get a hands on it. You can't do that now because more people do organic chemistry in more languages, in more countries. There's just more of them. So you can now just take a piece of that subject and say you master it rather than the whole subject because more people do it. And you'd have to really know Mandarin to really do it well. Something that no one would dream of. We had to learn, learn German, which was sort of common then. But a completely change. More people do science. There are more journals in science. That's just one area <coughs> of science. There are many other things we'll talk about, types of knowledge. So the world really shifted. Shifted in a way that you don't read that about that. It didn't make it, what is Tom, Tom Friedman, that silly book? It didn't make the world flat at all. But it did make it closer and more competitive. So when you read that you should, Ireland, I was reading this smart Ireland report someone kindly gave me, that you should just invest more in science and technology. Think about what you're up against when you do that. Smart as this country is, and it is, bright people here. There's 1.4 million Chinese, 1.4 billion Chinese, and they're not stupid either. <laughs> you have to trust me on that. To say nothing of the Indians who invented mathematics. <coughs> You have to all think, whenever you look at any issue in your own economy, visa the knowledge, think about who, think of the global economy, who you're up against, because everyone's going to be competing with everyone else. It's sort of hyper competition. That's one giant event that's taking place in knowledge. The second one, excuse me, and one that's even less noted than the first one is. The spectacular drop in the cost of information transactions. Spectacular drop. I'm, I'm not the only one in this room old enough to remember. When you wanted to get some information, you'd have to go to a good library, figure out where the information was in the library, negotiate with the librarian on getting the damn stuff, waiting till you got it, hopefully it was there, it was a big deal, transacting information costs, getting something. I was a, a PhD student myself in New York City. New York City had large libraries. It still does. You'd have to go there and wait. It was a big deal. Now that's gone. I mean, for information, it generally, it's getting simpler. And the, it's transparent, it's free, and it's ubiquitous. I mean, if it isn't today, it will be tomorrow. Information. This is a spectacular change also. It, it's something that's inconceivable to most of you because you don't remember what it used to be like. <laughs> but it was, it was really hard. You had, so dissertations were cruder, less interesting, less complex because you could only dominate so much information. You could always get so much information. And having information gave you power. It gave, gave you a type of power. Governments, companies. That's not true anymore. The costs of information, have the transaction costs of information, Transaction costs. There's a whole school of economics called. Well, you know this. I, I speak some, do this stuff so much I forget who I'm talking to. I just transaction cost economics, of which a number of Nobel prizes have been awarded, you know, really shows it's come down to zero. However, what they don't talk about, and which I, one of these men who won the Nobel prize, I sat next to at a dinner at the World Bank, Douglas North. I said, how many transaction costs are not about information but are about knowledge? And I listened to every word he said. I mean, I don't often get a chance to do it. And he said, well, I think probably about half. And I said, if that's true, though, what happened to those costs? He says, I'm not sure. So I, want to, I went off to study that. 
knowledge transaction cost. So we have information transaction is going to zero, but knowledge tra at the time I was working as an advisor to McKinsey, the consultant firm. I had some children in college, I had to pay their bills, so I needed to work for them. And McKinsey has armies of people, bright young people, you can throw at a problem. So we began to look at what are knowledge transaction costs as opposed to information. And, how, and they haven't changed, they, they're going up. So you're seeing an interesting curve. What's the difference between the two? Ah, good question. What's the, what, I'm trying to, what do you think, an, what do you think an, an information transaction cost, what do you think those are? Right. So you want to jump right into it. Knowledge isn't code, is not necessarily code. So if I wanted to know, and when we, when we did this study, we studied five firms, their knowledge, and I'm going to get to their knowledge transaction course. <coughs> if you wanted to get a document, one of the firms we did was Novartis, the big drug firm in Basel, Switzerland. So if you wanted to know five good articles on a certain molecule that would help you, that you need in your research, how would you get those five articles? If you already knew, you know, how would you, what would you do? Look in Google, look at whatever biological databases, you could find the article. But what happens if you want to talk? You want to find out who's the leading researcher? Who's the leading researcher on this molecule? What would you do then? Well, you might, but would you bet the farm on that? Would you, uh, what would you really do? Real life time, what would you do? Yeah, you, who would you talk to? The well, it goes back to the old theory in terms of uh, knowledge transfer and the fact that there were gatekeepers. Right. So you, who, who, who can transact between the internal and, or, and external. So you'd find the person you could get closest to who could answer that question, mm -hmm. who could bring you to. You would make calls or emails. <coughs> you would <coughs> somehow try to find who that person is. You might go online, but you wouldn't depend on that especially if it was something that ne wasn't necessarily online. That's a knowledge transaction. And that has not been reduced that much by technology. And it's gotten higher economic payback. That's one form of knowledge transaction. How do you reach people? Think about it. When you need to reach out to someone who knows something, something who doesn't owe you someone, not a public figure, but someone who knows something you want to know, how do you get to them? Friend of a friend, right. Networks, various forms, but none of those are automatic. They're not information transactions, they're knowledge transactions. We found there are three major types of knowledge transactions as opposed to information ones. The first is search, which we just talked about. How do you find where knowledge is? Knowledge is what a person knows or groups of people know. We're not talking about information here, we're talking about what a person knows or what groups of people know. Let's say you're saving all your money and you and uh, your partner are going on a holiday to the Maldive Islands. You can look up the Maldive Islands in Google. You could probably buy a book or two about the Maldive Islands. But in truth, if you're saving a lot of money and it's important to you, what would you really rather do? Yeah, talk to someone who's been there or lives there. And that would take, think about that. It's the same sort of thing. That's the difference. When people ask, I try not to say what I do for a living because then people, when I'm on a, a cruise or on an elevator, because people then ask me an enormous amount of questions I don't feel like answering. <laughs> but when I'm forced to do it, because my wife will say, he studies knowledge. Then people, what do you mean you study knowledge? And I usually use that very question. If you, the difference between reading a book about a country and going to a country. That's a pretty good street level definition. I mean, I've been to many, I've been to 90 countries, and I'm a big reader, I buy a lot of books, I read books, but very often you read a book about a country and you go to the country and the delta between the two of them is pretty strong. It's true for Ireland, it's true for anywhere, it's certainly true for my, the United States. People have remarkable images and thoughts about the U.S., but it's so big and so complex, reading a book would hardly, it's useful, but it wouldn't capture the complexity or vibrancy of the United States, or most places I'd say that's true. I recently, I was in Japan for two weeks and uh, my wife had never been to Japan. So I gave her some books to read and I tried talking to her about it. But at the end of the two weeks, she said, you know, none of it prepared me for the reality of Japan, which is very powerful reality. She said, none of these, it was useful, I'm glad to know these things, 
but it wasn't. Um, so that's sort of the difference. So knowledge search. The biggest bulk of knowledge transactions is not in search. That's sort of somewhat easy. The biggest bulk is knowledge adaptation. Adaptation. Again, quite different from information. If you're searching for information, uh, the GNP of Morocco, the Ford Company's earnings for the last 10 years, uh, how many Irish people won the Nobel Prize? If you're searching for information, there's usually a, an answer that fulfills it perfectly. It's a number or a word or a string of words, right? Usually information searches have very discreet, simple, not even simple, but discreet answers. When you're searching for knowledge, it's not that way. It's usually somewhat of an open-ended question. Should we invest in China? What's the outlook for copper as a commodity? What really caused World War I? <laughs> you know, how do you become an entrepreneur in Botswana? These aren't things that necessarily there's one answer or a series of sentences. You want to talk to someone. And that's a type of adaptation. When you, when, you, when you find knowledge, you adapt it to your own needs, which means reflection, which means bringing it in, chewing on it, thinking about it. Recently, I've, uh, I was just telling some of the people in this room, we had dinner last night, that I've started to write a book <coughs> on, <coughs> on the relationship between knowledge and judgment. So I got interested in the literature of judgment. If I was writing a book on the Russo-Japanese War, I could find books on the Russo-Japanese It started here, here are the generals who fought it, here are the major battles. But I now own these quite a few books on judgment and I've been working my way through. I have to adapt them to my needs. None of them are exactly what I want. If they were, I wouldn't write my own book. You have to swallow, chew them, swallow them, maybe spit them out. And that's true at Novartis. We have these oncology researchers who said, well, by the time, now that's, that's who we measured. We had them keep logs, logs of what they did each day. Was it a knowledge transaction? What type was it? It was a little crude, but we got it to work. And they said, well, I finally mate with Professor Schmidt at the University of Basel. After a lot of negotiation, he meets with me. But I don't have a question for him like, well, this molecule, what do you think? And when you do this to it, will that occur? I'm not going to waste his time or mine with a simple question. It's more discussing the context of this whole molecule. What value can it bring? How do we use it? Where should I use it? What's the best advantage of using that molecule? It's different. It's a different type of give and take with knowledge than it is with information. It's knowledge is a different thing than information. And it takes more money and more time to work with knowledge. If it didn't, you wouldn't be here. Think about it. You wouldn't have to go as a lovely city. You don't have to, I don't have to come here. I've been here. It's nice, I'm happy to come here, but I don't have to. But I do. If knowledge was the same as information, I could just send you a paper. I'd give you a pill. I could say, 7.8, there's your answer. <laughs> I wouldn't have to fly, stay up all night, you know? But that's not true, is it? Not even close to being true, no. These, this, there's a tremendous industry filled with bullshit artists who tell you that distance doesn't matter spectacular amount of vendors and consultants all doing it for the money. They themselves are always on planes. All the business planes, something I consider myself a great authority on, are full. Almost always, the planes are full. It might make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> the planes, especially international flights, if distance didn't matter, why the hell is everyone? Uh, you might want to see your grandchildren, I understand, but it's generally business people going to meetings. Because it's a knowledge transaction. If it could be transacted different, no one likes to spend the money, the time, the difficult, especially flying is less pleasant than it used to be. I, I get, I'll tell you a story about this that I like telling. I hope it translates. This is another type of knowledge transaction. We tell a story from a different country. Even though Ireland's not that different than the US, at least the part of the US I'm from, but sometimes uh, I used to take enormous amount of times there's a shuttle that goes from Boston to New York City. So every hour this plane goes from Boston to New York. And it's full of business people and various types going back and forth because we don't have trains in the US. You should take a train. It'd be cheaper and simpler, but we don't, the trains aren't, have been defunded. 
by the airline industry. So we don't, the trains don't work very well. So you have to take a much more expensive flight. So I took this flight an enormous amount of times. So about 10 years ago, I was taking this flight. 6.30 in the morning, first flight. And I'm there, you know, and all the other tired white men were all standing there. <laughs> and I just got a cell phone. I was given one by the company I was working with at the time, IBM. A big son of a bitch, but I heard it ring. In my briefcase, who would be close? Six, I thought it was a wrong number. I couldn't. I pulled it out. It looked like a brick with an antenna. <laughs> and lo and behold, it's my dear wife. I said, you know, your client called you. Your meeting was canceled. You don't have to go to New York. So it's 6.30 in the morning. I'm looking at all these guys. I put the thing down. So I'm wearing a tie and jacket. Now, I have decided at that moment to find out where all these people are going and why are they going there. I've been curious about this. And I said, I'm going to do it. So I went up to 100 people, more or less. I wrote this up in a study. I said, where are you going? I'm going to New York. You know, if you, I, I sound like they do. I, I, I've lost some of that accent, but when I'm with people like that, it comes back. Well, what firm do you work for? And often they'd mention either a large hospital, a large financial service firm, but large firm. So don't you have technology to do this by video, do this various ways? They go, oh, yeah, yeah. This flight cost about then about three or four hundred dollars for the ticket. You have to take a taxi cab when you arrive in New York City. To get into New York City, you have to take a taxi cab that's 30 or 40 dollars and it's driven by mad Somalians. So you really have a lot of trouble. If you have high blood pressure as I do, you, it's life threatening getting into the city. It's dirty and it's somewhat dangerous and tiring. So I said, why are you doing this? If you have this equipment, you have video technologies, audio tech, distance doesn't matter. It was a popular book called The Death of Distance. So distance doesn't matter. You have all this stuff. Why are you going? And they said, oh, I, I have to be there. I said, okay, your boss told you you had to be there. No, no, no. Who told you you had to be there? I just have to be there. They get frustrated. It's early in the morning. People haven't had coffee. They get a little angry at me. But I pushed on. This is what we said. This is the science. I know you're pissed off, yeah, I have coffee. But what do you mean you have to be there if you weren't told you had to? What's propelling you? What internal demon is making you do spend a thousand dollars, be unhappy? You, see, you don't understand. I do understand, actually. It's telling you. You just have to go. And it was bad. That was the most common answer. Finally, one guy told me the best answer. I wrote this in a paper. I loved it. Again, I'm not sure you'd understand this, but he said, You're from here, aren't you? I said, yeah. Did you ever play various forms of tag, boys, games? Yeah. I said, why are you asking me that? Sure I did. He said, Remember there was one kid who was always it? Said, yeah, I do, actually. My, my brother was one. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, I did. He said, if you don't go to the meeting, you're it. <laughs> and I realized, of course, that in spite of all our technologies, we still need to be there. Being there, there's no substitute. But being there, part of it is a knowledge transaction thing. If you're not there, you're not going to understand the cues, the subtext, the messages, the emotions, all the things that go. If it was just information, you'd get an email, you'd get a memo. But if there's more than information, you need to be there because you want the fullest spectrum of what message you're getting. Because your career depends on it. These are people, you know, really your livelihood depends. And if it costs you an unpleasant day, it's a short price to pay. I think there's a new book by a guy named Russell Harden at NYU on street level epistemology on, I forgot the exact title, but that's the reworking title they use. How most people use knowledge rationally, although you may not think so when you investigate the patterns of the behavior. But when someone goes for a trip like that, they're doing it for rational reasons. They're saying, it's important for me to do this because I'll miss a message that could affect my career. Though watching it from on high, from a research point of view, you might say, uh, why are they spending $1,000 a day if they have video tech, that they have some form of technology? Pretty interesting thing. So let's get, that's what knowledge transactions are. That the expense you use, not so much to find the knowledge or to transfer the knowledge, but to make it your own. Digest it, chew it, ruminate on it, understand it, reflect. <laughs> and reflecting. I just read this book. What does it mean? I just read this report. How can I use it? I just had this conversation. What did it mean to me? Taking notes, reflecting. If you don't do that, then you yourself become more powerful. So knowledge, <coughs> although we don't often teach these things, this is what I'm talking to you about. It's not taught and it's not researched much, but it's observed. You can see it. 
You can see it in practice. Donald Stern wrote this book, The Reflective Practitioner, years ago. He wrote about this stuff. Chris Argyris wrote about this years ago. But it never caught on because it didn't get associated with the word knowledge. Now when we talk about the difference between knowledge and information, we can bring back some of those tools. Reflection. I'm not talking about an airy type of sitting back. But really making sense of something. Reading a document. Having a conversation. The very act of wrestling with complex material. Information by itself is not that complex. It can be complex, but it's discreet. It's bounded. Knowledge isn't. So... Let's talk a little again. <coughs> Those are the, <coughs> sorry for this, this wicked cough. I just, it's not swine flu, it's just a cough. <laughs> don't, don't run, don't run out, I promise you. I've been to a physician. Let's talk a little about how these things work themselves out. And again, in day-to-day -day life, you might say, of what's going on in the world. So I'm going to present a number of themes to you, any one of which we could spend the entire week talking about. The first is the democratization of knowledge, which I made reference to earlier. Democratization of knowledge. That's not only really going on in the world, which we spoke about. You just, all you have to do is look at a newspaper and see it. It's going on within organizations. And to me, this is a fascinating thing. When organizations first came about, large industrial organizations, once again, they came about in a certain number of areas. What, where were the first real companies that you would recognize as companies? Where did they start? Where did they rise up? Companies that you would recognize as companies. Where? Where? England is one. What do what those companies do? Uh, the Lord of the came later, so the yeah, trains. The trains, they made clothes on clothes, like textiles, exactly right. Where else? Where else? The, go the, back to the trading companies. Where? Exactly. The, go back to the Dutch, the Dutch the, trading company. VNU, yeah, the Dutch, yeah. 17th, 17th century. The Dutch invented capitalism and they invented the trade, the forms of organizations to do this. Where else? Good answers, where else? Where do you think chemicals were made and electrical equipment? Germany. Germany, absolutely, Germany. Large, Bayer and BASF, uh, and Siemens. And the US, the railroads and steel made in the US. And Japan, once they got their act together, made all the steel, made all the electrical, they became the England of Asia once they figured out how to do it. When these firms, these countries, and these sort of things all came together, what models did they use? Not so much the trading companies, because we can exempt them a little bit, but the industrial concerns. The, what models did they use to organize themselves? Where did they get the ideas? I mean, nothing comes from nothing. Novo, I forgot how I used to say that in Latin. Horace said it, nothing comes from nothing. So they didn't just say, oh, let's do this. Not, that never happens in life. What models did they have for organizations that managed complex work with many people over time and space? Who else knew how to do that? Military. The military. And number two, secondary to that? Church. The church. These are the only two things on earth that knew how to do that. And if you look at those two organizations, their hallmark was command, control, and fear. That's how they run. Command, control, and fear. And it worked. They took that model, and it worked magnificently. The wealth of the world increased 14 times. Not 14%, 14 times from 1880 to 2000. Angus Madison figured all these numbers out. God love him. And there were a big OECD book he published. 14 times. Do you know how much wealthier you are than your great, 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 great grandparents? How much easier our lives are? I mean, we've lost, it's impossible because we don't see it. But go to rural Africa and you'll see how they lived. Mine and yours. Our lives are, we have infinitely more stuff. Are we happy is another matter. It's not, I'm not going to talk about that here. It's not my preview. As Obama said, it's above my pay grade. 
Are we, are we nicer? Are we happier? Not for me. You can answer that. But we sure have a lot more stuff. I, you know, I even remember my, my, I was joking once with my grandmother, who did speak English. My, mother's been, my mother took me to buy some clothing. I got two new shirts. And I said, Graham, look at these two new shirts I had. I said, does Grandpa have a lot of shirts? And she says, he has three. I couldn't believe it. He only has three shirts. I already had ten had more shirts than that, but it's a different world. So we, the division of work, organized by command, control, bureaucracies, run by fear. Fear. You don't work, you don't work you're gone. You're in the military, you don't obey orders, you're shot, the church you don't obey, you go to hell. In various ways, fear undergirds this stuff. You starve, you're thrown out, you know, various things happen to you. That model worked. And it worked for the manipulation of land, labor, and capital. That's what it was built for, to manipulate the three traditional sources of wealth. Land, meaning all resources, capital, meaning mostly financial capital, and labor, meaning physical labor. Henry Ford, who epitomized what I'm talking about, he's like the Max Weberian ideal type, said, why do I want to pay for the worker's arm? Excuse me, for the worker's head. I only want his arm. However, if knowledge becomes a source of wealth that's greater than land, labor, and capital, so you'd rather have some smart people who can figure out new models, new technologies, new ways of working. This model doesn't work as well. It's not as good a model at all. At all. And you can see the results of this in the headlines. I worked for IBM for about seven years. Do smart, innovative people want to work for IBM? They have a lot of trouble finding them. Do, do smart, innovative people want to work for Microsoft? No, they all want to go to Google. They don't, they don't want to work for, because Microsoft and IBM, sad to say, still are, they physically resemble and spiritually resemble those 19th century firms we just spoke about. But Google doesn't. Maybe they will, but they don't today. What, why don't knowledge people want to work with those organizations? Outside of the aesthetics, so let's look at structure. What, what's wrong with those firms in terms of knowledge? What do you think? Too much control. Sorry? Too much control. Too much control. Who runs those firms? Think of a large industrial firm. Who runs, what sort of person runs them? Previous military. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, somewhat previous military. That's not always bad. So, you know, the military actually, in a great stroke of irony, they're more interested in knowledge than firms are. I, I'm not kidding. There's a tremendous reversal. I, mean, I don't have time to go into that. But it's, <laughs> right. Well, it's life and death. They think, hey, you know, if knowledge could help us from dying and win the battle, we'd rather use knowledge. It's really, that happens to be, I've done quite a bit of work with that, so have other people, that happens to be true. But why don't they like, to, to, let's, and I'm just not talking, I want to make this really clear about science knowledge, about the sort of, when you hear the word knowledge, I was talking about biomedical, informatics, PhDs. I'm talking about people who know something, be it in design, be it in art, be it in an organizational structure, we're not just talking about one type of knowledge but having some skills and expertise that have a value in the marketplace. Why don't they like working in those large firms? They may have to do it. But they're not run by people who have the same knowledge as you have. That's, abs that's really true. And people are sort of homophiliac. They like having people work for them who they respect because they have the similar sort of... If you go to a firm like McKinsey, there are no professional managers. The people running McKinsey are consultants who Maybe they're more ambitious, have more focus, but they still, and every McKinsey executive have to have client. They still have to do 30% client work. So you're still doing the same stuff as the young kids are doing. And people respect that. It makes it easier to follow them. So you're absolutely, what are some of the other reasons? Creative freedom. Yeah, creative freedom. People are more, they're more likely to give you space and time to ruminate, to think about things, than a machine model, which is What's the, how, many, how many things do we produce today? It's very hard to adjust that, though. I'll tell you a very positive story about IBM. I keep blasting poor IBM, but I had a, 
a good friend of mine, because some of their R&D executives did figure this out. I had a friend of mine who got his PhD in computer science, Dave Klein, and he got a job. IBM has a giant research laboratory called Watson Labs, and it's over the Hudson River, north of New York City. Beautiful buildings, and donated by Rockefeller. And he got a job there, and he, because this is 25 years ago, so every morning he went to work, white shirt, blue tie, everyone looks, it looked like an army of researchers. And he's walking to his office, and he saw a corner office where a guy did not have a tie on and had cowboy boots, and they were up on the desk. The guy was sitting back with his boots up and just thinking. Even though IBM's slogan was think, this guy actually was taking it literally, and it was an, a tremendous anomaly. It was like a, he said, like a, a tarantula on a piece of angel food cake. The guy stood out, and Dave couldn't believe it. I mean, it was like... Every day he'd walk by this guy's office, and the guy, sometimes he'd be writing something on a piece of paper, but he's mostly watching the swans on the Hudson River, the bird life there, and he couldn't believe it. My friend became obsessed with this man. <laughs> he asked around what that guy does. No one seemed to know. Oh, he's always that way. What do you care? You know what I mean? But he became obsessed. He's a little crazy, my friend. And he, after a week or two, he began to lose sleep, and his work <laughs> suffered and he had to know what this guy did. <laughs> so the culture of IBM was not that you go to someone and ask a direct question about what someone else does. Even most firms today, that's not that common. But he did. He went to the man who worked for us, a man named Ralph Gomery, who's a very senior R&D executive in the United States. He still is. And he said, Dr. Gomery, I hate to do this, but I'm, it's really affecting me. There's that man in that room. It's a, he certainly seems different than the rest of us. Could you tell me what he does here? And Gomery, who was, was an ex-military guy, and a sort of gruff fellow, said, Dave, that guy had an idea three years ago that saved IBM $700 million. Leave him alone. He may have another one. <laughs> <laughs> like, like other stories, that one really ep epitomizes an attitude you don't find in most large firms, because it's saying, Let's take an option. Let's take a rider. We'll leave this guy alone. Maybe he will and maybe he won't. It's hard to report back to capital markets saying we have 12 people who are paying X amount and we can't guarantee their output. We don't know what we're going to get from them. The odds may be favor. They might do something useful, but we can't prove it, can you? It's like having children. You don't really, <laughs> in a way, you don't really know what you're going to get. You can improve the odds, but you can't guarantee the output. And it's a very similar thing. So this command and control model, it's aesthetically unpleasant, but it's also, the worst thing about it <coughs> is that <coughs> it's not made for knowledge. It's not made for knowledge development, retention, or transfer. It was made for other things. And if the wealth of an organization is more determined on knowledge development, retention, and transfer, it's the wrong model. And this is one of the great sources of tension in the world today, and one of the great things that are causing dysfunction in internal economies. Because we're trying, you know, when a lot of organizations, when they're in economic downturn, rather than rethink how are we organized, how do we make money, how should we do things, let's do things harder. You have to work harder. Not differently, you just have to work harder. It's, point, it's a pointless game, but they don't have those kind of models because what I'm talking to you about is not taught anywhere. Oddly enough, I used to teach a little bit of this at the Harvard Business School, and um, it was quite successful. And then the dean told me that he didn't think knowledge was really a subject. He says, I'm not making this up. And he, I said, this is, I looked around, it was like being on a Monty Python show. I said, this is Harvard, and you don't tell me knowledge is a subject. What do you think you exist for? if knowledge isn't a subject. He said, we think a firm can be defined as, you know, the coordination of technology, finance, and marketing. I looked at him. He's gone now. He, he, and he said, you know, that's really, that's just flat out wrong. I don't care if you're the dean and I'm just an independent reader. That's just ridiculous. I said, I'm not going to quote chapter and verse. Well, we just disagreed and he left. But I mean, most business schools in the U.S., not so much the U.K. or here, and not at all in Japan or China, <laughs> or most of Europe and the U.S., they don't think it's a subject. You could short U.S. stocks if you believe that. The business people know it's a subject. I mean, the companies know, governments know, but not the business. Schools are sometimes 
my, nothing personal here, I mean, this is not true of NUI Galway, but in general, my impression is that business schools are about 20 years behind practice. So if something happens in the world in practice, it's about 20 years before the school say, oh, we'll teach a class on that or we'll write a case about it. But people are now desperately trying for the new, how should we organize ourselves to better exploit and explore knowledge, not using command and control mechanisms which don't work well. That is the issue. And a lot of people want to work for small firms because they're better at that. They want to work for deeply international firms like Google because they're better at that. Or firms that are run by people who don't have those backgrounds, who don't have the need to control. The other thing about democratization of knowledge is that when you don't have it, you fail. You're not taking it. What percentage, what percentage of non-capital goods do large firms spend on knowledge? Do you know? Universe, globally true. What percent non-capital goods do they spend on knowledge? Who do you think? In the years. Percentage. Yeah. Yeah. All the money they spend. Pardon? Well, not all salaries, but a fair amount of it, right? I came to IBM, I was 50 years old, right? 50. So, let's say you have someone 30 who had the same degrees I had. So, in terms of human capital, we looked alike. So they're the same degrees. I was fatter, balder, crankier, less tolerant than someone 30. So I'm no bargain, right? I'm not that nice. <laughs> they paid me 10 times what they paid that other person, 10 times more. What did they buy? Uh, experience. Do you think experience is the same thing as knowledge? The ox, the ox that goes to Mecca is still an ox. <laughs> Yes, this absolutely. Yeah. And you can't you can't prove it though, but it's, a, it's an option, it's a flyer. So if you're spending ten times more someone fifty than thirty with this trip, what do you buy? You buy access to knowledge. Technically. So firms spend between sixty and seventy percent of their money on knowledge and they have no idea what they're doing. They don't know. They don't know what's knowledge. If you talk about knowledge, most of them will throw you but that's what they spend on training. A lot of technology, a lot of applications supposedly have knowledge of, but it's certainly salaries. What do you think? And yet, if you don't use the knowledge of those people, it's a big waste, isn't it? Which most firms don't have a clue and don't want to know the knowledge because they don't want to give up power. But what's most important is that um, if you don't use the people you pay, if you don't take advantage of their knowledge, why do you pay them? Why don't you just have robots or teach, teach animals to do it? It's extraordinary to me how little this is done. And this will change. Talk about the future of knowledge. Let me give you a very dramatic incident that just happened, though I could give you 10,000 if I wanted to. We have a summer house in Cape Cod, and I share it with another couple. I'm dying to go there. I just can't wait for the summer. This other couple has a son who's a was a fairly senior fellow at Lehman Brothers, the late Lehman Brothers. And I kept thinking about him when I read the paper about Lehman Brothers. <coughs> and <coughs> we, went to, we went to the house to bring down some farm equipment just recently. And there he was. He was using it. Sure, the name's Jeff. I said, Jeff, nice to see you. Guy's about 32, smart, very well educated guy. So I said, let's have a drink, because I had an ulterior motive. I think he knew that, too. So we're sitting having a drink. He said, Jeff, I have one, one, and he looked at me, so smiling, because he knows what I do for a living. I said, I have, a, I have a question I have to ask you. Did you know you were going right over the cliff? He said, oh, yeah. Did your friends know that, the people who work with you? Yeah, we all knew we were going over the cliff. So you did, you're like a lemon. You knew you were going over the cliff, what happened? He says, it didn't matter. He said, absolutely no one would listen to us in the firm. Absolutely no one would. The people around the firm, Dick Fold and this is so, even though these guys are upper middle management, so they're smart guys, they know, you know, they're not far from the top, 
no one would listen to them, and no one ever had listened to them. So the firm's gone. Now, I don't care so much that the firm's gone, but many, many people got hurt because of that. People who don't deserve to be hurt, people who weren't protected by the government. And the main reason, if you had had any form of democracy in that firm, where they would ask people, what is going on? What do you think is happening in the world? What should we do? They could have saved it. I don't know if they could have saved themselves, but they might have. I, I know a fellow who is a fairly senior guy at the Hewlett Packard Company. Hewlett Packard, all these, this is the, again, this is what they call the tyranny of leadership. We, we, we emphasize leadership so much that we've become crazed and it, it mitigates against the democratic use of knowledge. Hewlett Packard is run by a crazy woman named Carly Fiorina, a moron and a mean person, known to all as that. She decided to buy another technology company called Compaq. The people who worked for Hewlett Packard, big, very good firm, knew this was a disaster. People know in industries what the other firms are like. If you work in an industry, you know what the other firms in your industry are like. That's a fairly simple, don't do it, it won't fit, it's not a good firm. Everyone felt that way, she didn't care. So a number of people who work for HP, smart people, wrote to the investment banks who were really cutting the deal with them. We, the undersigned, plan to quit Hewlett Packard. We know we can't stay after we stay this. We'd be fired, even though they're senior people, to tell you that this is an awful idea. And they wrote to Goldman Sachs, they wrote to J.P. Morgan, the people And they got no answer back, no answer back. And they were really upset. And one of them had knew someone who could get to someone. So how come you're not responding? This is an important letter. And the guy tells us, we don't care. We just want to make the deal. We get money if the deal is made. We don't care if the firm disappears. Harm a lot of people, do really damage to the United States economy. So it went through and it was a terrible deal. Hewlett Pack will never be the same again. And it'll slowly sink. If that firm had an inch of dem democratization, so let's say Carly put it to a vote, even if it was non-binding, she asked the people who work there, what do you think of what's going on? Or she asked the investment bank to do it. Should we make this deal? Should we buy Compact? Overwhelmingly, they'd say no, and they'd probably still be in business, doing well. But she couldn't do it, because we elevate leaders. You know, it's interesting, we, the United States, and somewhere in Ireland and England, there's an Anglo-American model of capitalism, which hates communism and hates socialism, but doesn't mind it in their, own com in their companies. It's a remarkable thing where you can go to a country like Japan, which does, theoretically, the people in Japan don't particularly like democracy. They can see all its faults. So you can talk to people in Japan, but their firms are run democratically. The US, people love democracy, but the firms are run exactly as Stalin ran Russia. Absolutely no difference. Any opposition, you're out. One person, one rule. And it's a disaster when it comes to knowledge because knowledge is profoundly social and it's much more valuable in a democratic culture. It becomes a more valuable thing. Knowledge is profound. There's no such thing as individual knowledge. You may think there is. There's individual skills. There's individual talents. There's individual memories. But there's not individual knowledge. Knowledge itself is a social thing. Uh, we can't go into a whole class here on epistemology. You can read about this. It's a very interesting subject. But there's no such. So when you say one person can understand an organization, that person has enough knowledge. This is a complete fantasy. I was once, I, for my sins, not only did I work for IBM, which was an abominable thing I had to do, because I had a sick child in the insurance. I also worked for Ernst & Young. I was a partner of Ernst & which made IBM look like McKinsey. And I remember the head of Ernst & Young telling me in front of always, I know what goes on in this firm. This is a massive federation of firms around the world. All they knew was what went on in his office. That's all anyone can know. Knowledge is deeply dependent on the way you stand. If you stand in a little room all day and have people just talking to you, that's what you're going to know, the little room and the people talking to you. If you get out, you may have a chance of knowing what goes on. You may. You may not too. Your brain isn't open to it. But if you want better decisions, open up the firm. Open up the organization. Never work for an organization, those of you who are still young that isn't have old democratic processes. And I don't mean fake democracy and all the bullshit that goes along with this. There's a lot of 
bread and circus stuff that goes on over here. Well, I'll hire more women. I like hiring women. I have daughters. I think it's a great idea. It doesn't guarantee anything. Sorry. Hire more people of color. I'm all for it. It doesn't guarantee anything. Have democratic processes. You have more of a guarantee. And it turns out, if you have cognitive diversity, you can almost guarantee better outcomes. This is a hot new subject in knowledge, too. It's like a cousin of democratization. There's a very good book, a book that I don't read too many books about knowledge that change my opinion about knowledge that much, but I've been studying it a lot. Then you begin to develop your own mental models, all of us do. And if you're a physicist, <coughs> it's fairly rare you read an article that changes your outlook on physics. And that's true for a lot of your economics. You know. Well, I read this book called The Difference by a fellow named Scott Page, PhD, he's in Michigan. The book's published by Princeton. What Scott did was, some of this was hard going, you don't want to read all of it. But what he did is show that 10 experts looking at a problem will have a less optimal outcome than 10 people who aren't experts but have diverse perspectives. Think about that. And diverse perspectives, not based on color or gender per se, they may, but may not. It's based on their mental equipment. They, it's called their mental toolbox. So if you, I, some of you, a lot of you are from different perspectives. One of the values of teaching a class like this, having a program like this we were talking earlier, is if you incorporate different perspectives, you have better outcomes. If you were going to solve a problem as a group, the odds are, and the real odds, that you'd have a better outcome to solve the problem because you have different perspectives than all 30 of you are economists, or all 30 of you are sociologists, or all, anything. You know, for years and years, you go to a law firm, you can go to a big law firm, and they say, well, we put 10 lawyers on this, but they couldn't solve it. We need another 10. <laughs> 10 can't do it. Why would another 10 know the same thing? McKinsey, to their credit, used to do the same thing. I mean, it was, it's a bit of a money maker. I think they're honest enough. They would, I like to think they're honest enough. But they, wouldn't, but they said, now oh, we have this team of eight consultants working on your problem. Your problem's so complex, you have to put another eight consultants. Because the same eight MBAs in the same eight schools, you just, McKinsey now hires less than 50% MBAs. Less than 50% MBA. The MBA becomes a commodity. Knowledge has this temporal. Another great lesson about it. it's temporal. What MD, when I first became a management consultant, I remarried, I had children, I needed money, so I became a management consultant, thinking I could do what I like doing, which is research and make some money and help firm. MBA knowledge was arcane and somewhat religious. You go to an organization and you somewhat be like a Gnostic priest. You tell them, we can solve your problem because we have, we can do regression analysis. <laughs> and that word, sort of like a Druid priest said, we can do booga booga. I mean, people would say, oh, you can do, because you could do it and they couldn't. And you have a timeshare computing and you would do regret and you give them an answer that looks scientific. That's what literally, knowledge gets dressed up and brought out. And it looks pretty fancy. What happened? What knowledge you overcame? Now, any, any idiot, you can get an MBA in this. Any, any of the tools that MBAs used to snow the clients, to impress them, became commodities. That, that knowledge got democratized real fast. Now, I'm not saying you still want MBAs. There's still no interest in things, valuable things. But you can't do that the same way. And McKinsey came to this realization. So now they just hire very smart people. And figure, they'll figure out a way to bring value to the client. So last time I worked for them, which is... Uh, I went, worked on a project about six months ago for the World Bank that's still on. And I, I sat next to this woman from McKinsey, and you know, you chat with her. I said, where are you from? And she was from South Africa, and she had a PhD in the early music of Johann Sebastian Bach. And you know, <laughs> this is a World Bank project on knowledge strategy. And I said, you don't want to be rude. And I like Bach's music, it sounded nice to me. I said, uh, do you have another degree? You know. And, she said, no, no, that's the degree I have. I said, well, that's pretty interesting. I said, How did you get this job? She said, well, they recruited me. 
I said, okay, I'm just going to forget all forms of politeness here and say, how come they recruited you if you have a PhD in musicology and they're trying to solve these arcane issues of knowledge which you'd need a background in economics? She said, I could learn all that. She was right. She was, they just wanted someone smart and she was real smart and she just learned what she needed to learn and it was a, quite a good team. It turned out she was quite a valuable player. It's not, if you wanted to talk about Bach, it was also nice. You could really... <laughs> I couldn't... Quit keep, and I met people with PhDs in neurophysiology. I mean, they just hired, our Microsoft does that too, I've heard. They ran out of computer science. The US does not produce that many computer science PhDs anymore because they don't want to fight against the Indians or the Chinese. So Microsoft either can get, and it's hard to get visas to come into the US with that degree. So now they just hire smart people, figure they could teach them that. It's an interesting thing about that. So diverse outcomes, diverse knowledge, cognitive diversity, you'll get a better outcome. Now, how do you do this? Well, you can't let the P HR people do it. They kill it. There's, there's a function that's just worthless. It's dead. Don't, don't have anything to do with them. I'm sorry if I offend some of you, but they're just worthless. They, every year, there used to be articles in the Harvard Business Review, HR, new ideas, HR is coming along, and it never happened. It's dead. They don't get it. They've just, Tom Stewart calls them the shock troops of the power elite. They're sort of worthless. IT gets it more than HR, but not a lot. You're just going to have to do it yourself. What we do in, in NASA and at McKinsey, we just got the ideas across and we sold a number of people. So NASA, which has giant project teams, we now try to ensure cognitive diversity. Sometimes it's gender, sometimes it's color or ethnicity, but most often it's engineers working with human factors, with ecologists, with sociologists, with other people to do better project management. And it's really had a good effect. The same thing with McKinsey. So that's it useful thing when we talk about the future of knowledge. As we get to know more about knowledge, we know more how to work with knowledge. And this is one of the things we know. This is one of the things we know. So I wanted, that was the democratization of knowledge. I have to put on glasses. To see. Isn't that awful? Don't get it. Getting older just, it's awful. What would an organization look like that actually took knowledge seriously. Let me ask you, think about this. What would it look like that took knowledge seriously as an input, as an output, and as the unit of analysis? Can you think of one? Did you run that slide again? <laughs> what would it, any organization look like? What would it feel like? What would it look like <laughs> that took knowledge seriously? So it has knowledge as an input, it has knowledge as an output, and knowledge was the unit of analysis, not money, not things, not land, labor, and capital, but knowledge. What would it look like? Can you think of any organization that does that? Yeah, no, no, that's, yeah, no, no, I think I, universities are becoming more like companies and vice versa, but I would think that's, that's a very good answer. Universities are pretty, they've been doing it more or less, you know, it's funny about universities. I give this talk around the world, various forms of it. And everywhere I go, not everywhere, but many countries think they have the first university. If you go to Italy, of course, it's absolutely positive. It's Bologna. You go to France, they think it's the Seine. You go to Oxford, they think it's a... But you go to Korea, they think they have the first university. You go to Bangladesh, which actually has a good argument that they are the first universities. No kidding. They're Buddhist academies in the year 800, uh, 800 AD. Uh, many countries, the Chinese are sure that they are the first, there's no question in their mind. So it's interesting, but you're right, at universities, that would be one. In spite of all their nuttiness, in spite of all the dysfunctions, they do take knowledge seriously. You're right. What else? That's a good answer, I'd agree with that. What else? Maybe Pardon? Catching shots? Interesting. Because they, you think, is it knowledge that the human analysis?
never thought about that. I like theater too. Maybe. A lot of non governmental organizations are very good too. Yeah, I works a lot for the World Bank. They sure try to be. The NGOs, various NGOs, they sure try to be. But they're so immersed in politics. So wrapped up in non knowledge activity. Well, so are schools. But they do look that way. They smell that way somewhat. You're right. They're trying. That's right. That's a good way to say it. They're trying. My colleagues in Rome when I say this, but it'll look like a, an open source project. <laughs> oh, no, that's, I agree. That, I would absolutely, why, why do you think people think they're wrong? You're right. I think it would look like an open source project, too. What's an open source project? Oh, uh, it's a software project where people come together from various different backgrounds and work together to create a software product, project. Uh, so no one's getting paid. They're not in the same organization. It's, glo it's global. Linux, Linux is the one that ever. I, I completely agree with that. So there's all sorts of interesting, use one of your own poets here in Ireland, you know, struggling to be born. There's a great poem by William Butler Yeats, What Rough Beast is Struggling to Be Born, uh, a great Yeats poem. Maybe there's a struggle to be born of a type of knowledge organization that a number of you are mentioning that will become a dominant model. They'll become, a, a, if not dominant, at least a common model in the world where knowledge is taken seriously. Maybe it'll look like McKinsey. I would think some of the big consulting firms, are, McKinsey certainly like this. It has its own faults. You could question it, but it's certainly pretty close to how I describe that. Maybe it looked like a think tank Maybe it'll look like a university. Maybe it won't look like anything any of us have in our minds. <laughs> something like the internet. No one knew what the internet was, now we have the Maybe it's something totally that none of us ever thought about. But one thing is for sure, something new will happen because the source of wealth shifted. So it's not a moral reason, it's not because I'm telling you this, the source of wealth has shifted to knowledge. And once that happens, Everything follows with dead reckoning, but it doesn't follow in a linear way. Years ago, again, I've had a very odd life. I've done things that are not always fun to do. I taught freshman history at a university, but it wasn't hard. It was a university for, I won't, I won't maybe I shouldn't say, it. it's a university for kids who aren't that smart. In the U.S. About, has a lot of universities, and some of them specialize in mediocre kids, and I had a job teaching them history. Not a pleasant thing to do. So I would say that, I'd give a lecture and say, it's commonly thought, I was young then, commonly thought that the Italian Renaissance started in the year 1453 with the capture of the Byzantine Empire by the Ottoman Turks and the migration of scholars to Italy from Constantinople. Students would write down, I don't understand, their thoughts. 1 1 1453, the Renaissance started. Is it just that day people woke up and said, oh man, it's the Renaissance. Thank God the Middle Ages are over. Bring on the wine, women, and songs. Throw out the priests. <laughs> we're in the money. And a lot of us, we're laughing, but a lot of us still think that way, that, you know, well, now we're in the age of knowledge. All these other things will disappear. We'll all have knowledge institutions. It ain't going to look like that at all. I would guess, and I, many of my colleagues think this too, most organizations would rather go down than change. They'd rather, like Lehman Brothers, they'd rather die than give up power. Rather die than give up power. I'm not being exaggerating here. I think most senior executives I've ever met literally would rather kill the firm than admit they were wrong or admit that they have to take less money or less power. That's how strong, the, this is like a tremendous narcotic that gets into people's veins. Very, very few, the sort of people who rise up in traditional organizations never give anything up. Never, never, never. They make George Bush like, look like uh, Mother Teresa. I mean, they're not. So we're going to see a lot of firms die. A lot. And new ones born, but a lot of pain in between. That, that, those shifts cause a lot of dysfunction and problems. But it won't just happen. It won't just happen. New things will be born, old things will die but it'll be a long time. Your grandchildren will live in a very different world that'll look more like what we're talking about because it's all the shift in soft and hard technologies. So what would you, if, since we have to live today, not tomorrow, Kierkegaard said that the tragedy of life is that we can only understand things backwards, but we have to live 
life going forward. I think he's, he was exactly right. What do you do today? You know, you get a job, you work in an organization. What are current knowledge practices and processes, something I really believe in, that, uh, that work, that you'll see in the future? What do you do today? I can give you some examples, but I'd like you, you to come up with some too, if you know of any. There are all sorts of different things people are doing now that wasn't done fairly recently. Some are in technologies, some are in practices and processes. But they're all based on knowledge, working on knowledge. Check the time. What time do you have to leave? Real soon. Yeah, I want to spend time for questions too. Sorry, this could, these are big subjects. We can go on for a long time. Let me just end with this and we'll look. I, I was working recently for, well, let me start with this differently. I worked for the World Bank for a number of years. I'm still working for them. And I heard a great speech there one time by their chief economist, Joe Stiglitz, who won the Nobel Prize in economics not long ago. And now and then, I don't know if I, I, you hear a speech, you say, wow, that's just true. And Stiglitz is a really smart guy. And what he said was, the global search and appropriation of new ideas is the only source of competitive advantage in the 21st century. And I listened to every word, the global search for and appropriation, appropriation of new ideas is the only source of competitive advantage. That's true for countries and it's true for companies. And it's true. So how do you do it? If that's true, if someone tells you something like that and you think it's true, what do you do? How do you globally search for ideas? How do you globally appropriate new ideas and bring them in and make them work? I mean, that's, he gave a simple sentence. He didn't have to live by it. But it's a, it's a damn difficult thing to do because we don't have the models. If you go to business school, you don't learn about this stuff. Maybe you do here, but it's not, it's not a common thing, believe me. So it's interesting. I can give you one or two examples. And then <coughs> stop and ask some questions. I worked for this Danish firm, Novozymes, N-O-V-O-Z-Y-M-E-S. It just came my way. They're a big enzyme and biomass conversion firm, a green energy firm in Copenhagen. And what they've done, they're geographically dispersed, and they're from a small country, Denmark, a little like Ireland in many ways. So they have to get out. <laughs> this is an important, if you live in a small country, there's an imperative to get out. People in New Zealand feel that way too. You have to get out. Not just read. This is, again, different between information and knowledge. You can't just read everything on the web. You have to get out and be there. No substitutes for being there. So they decided, rather than work on the serendipity factor by sending people to conferences, but give people the job, the task of being what they call idea scouts. Idea scouts. S-C-O-U-T-S. Scouts. They have 25 people who they're training. I was helping doing the training who for six months will do nothing else but seek out new ideas in the domains that they work in. They bring the ideas back to a central group who evaluate them for feasibility, for financial payoff, will this work, should we do it? And then they bring it to the board for funding. I said, man, that's a neat job. For people who get bored easily and like traveling and are intellectually lively, and they have people like that, that's a great, it's not for everyone. But then we said, well, let's go forth and multiply. How do you do it? I mean, how would you, so we decided on a training program of these people. How do you use intellectual networks? How do you train people on the principles of how the networks work? You can't just walk up to someone, you know, and say, hey, mate, I heard you know a lot about turning corn cobs into energy. Let me have it. You know, it doesn't work like that. I mean, no one's that food, but you can't even with great politics. You have to offer things in return. It's like life's not like that. And you have to find out where the knowledge is. You don't want to waste your time. You go to conferences. You learn what universities are studying things. You do a lot of background reading and writing so that by the time you make your pitch, you know what you're talking about and you have something to offer in return. But it's a wonderful idea. And that's a really knowledge process that's new. There's something. Other firms, they learned it, not from me, but from... Their biggest client is Procter & Gamble, who also do this. Not quite the same thing, but Procter & Gamble does this too. So smart firms are picking up the idea, and it really stems from a couple of simple premises. One is the one Stiglitz said, but two is you can't know it all. 
No company can know as much as they need to know. And that gets back to democratization. There was a time when the Ford Motor Company need, wanted to know and keep in house everything they needed to build a car. So they bought this iron ore, they bought the lakes that the iron ore was transported, it's all in the US. They owned every bit of Ford from the iron in the ground to the finished product. They could do it. You can't do that today. Life's not, and if you could, then next week someone will figure out a way to do it differently and you're screwed because you're married into processes that you've embedded in concrete. I've worked for all sorts of organizations that felt that if they didn't know it, it wasn't knowledge. The World Bank and McKinsey, two big clients of mine, both felt that way. We were talking about that over dinner. McKinsey now, every task force for new knowledge development has to have an outsider on it, has to have someone outside of McKinsey on it, professors, uh, people like me, because they feel without that, they're just gonna come up with the same answer they already know. The World Bank, for the first time ever, has outsiders writing some of their reports. We're really changing the way they do some of this stuff. It doesn't guarantee success, but you can't depend on knowing everything. You have to search the world and learn where ideas are. I once saw, I, I can't tell you the name of the firm, it's a firm you surely recognize, uh, a person, look, global talent search for this firm. And I visited his office and he had a wall that's a map on the wall, an interactive map, so it was an electronic map the size of that wall, of the world. And I said, what is that? And he said, well, if you promise not to tell the name of this firm, I'll show you what it is. The input into that map was, was, electronic, was intellectual activities in certain areas, and it globe on the map. So you come in one day and say, man, Taiwan, wow, what's going on? Taiwan's you know, red hot, it's glowing. And he then would call sometimes and say, find out what's going on in Taiwan, go there, read about it, something's happening. It's like science fiction, but they did, because the input, they would scan, all sorts of articles from the domain they're in, and then the software would translate the frequency of the words into the map. So there's you know, a lot of stories coming out of Taiwan about a new technology. Taiwan will light up. I, I was astounded. This is a very successful firm. But that's not that expensive to do. It just requires new ways of thinking. So we, we ran out of a bit of time here. I'm sorry. It's just, why don't we... Um, some of you must have some comments or questions you'd like to ask. Uh, Can I ask two questions? Yes, three, if it's okay with them. Uh, they're separate their relation, they want to do with cognitive diversity and organization knowledge. First one is, I would think that one of the most pressing issues in terms of knowledge is how much it takes into account what are called habitual externalities for such a long time, you know, such as human habits. Yeah, 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 absolutely right. You couldn't be more correct. You, ever, you know, a great example of that is the country of Russia. I mentioned Russia, maybe as a bully boy here. Russia has enormously high human capital. People are very well educated there, a lot of PhDs. It's a terrible place, and they don't produce much because of the externalities. You can see why, you can understand historically how it got to where it is, but it's not just knowledge and it's not just human capital. The externalities will kill the country. It'll kill the, the output of all that knowledge. So you're absolutely right. Knowledge is not a thing alone. It doesn't work by itself. I guess that's what you're trying to say, which is exactly true. Other things are information, land, labor, and capital. You can be a miserable cuss and have money. It's still, you still have the money. But knowledge won't work as well. So you're right. Warming. And it's based on, say, bees and fish and birds and other animals like that. They communicate with the animals that are just beside them, and in that way, the entire group knows what's going on. Uh, so it's used to spontaneously coordinate, in a sense, mass protests and other things like that. Like in Iran today. Yeah, yes. And it's also used to program robots. You know, I, I've always, now this is a subject we can open up. <coughs> this could be discussed from now till eternity. 
I am very suspicious of animal metaphors for human activities. I read them all the time as I'm very smart people believe in them. Machine metaphors or animal metaphors, I just don't buy them that much. I think we're alone in the universe. I think it's us and we're, di we're so different. Now, we're animal enough that it's worth learning about chimpanzees. But you know, you read that like 80% of what we share chromosomes or genes with sponges, 80%. That doesn't help me. <laughs> and I, I know that AI and robotics, I know what you're talking about. I just don't, you probably should have a different speaker speaking on that. I'm probably the wrong guy for that. It's hard enough to figure out human beings. And all this tremendous amount of stuff on Web 2.0 and Twitter and all this. And it was Second Life next year, last year, next year it'll be something different. It's the same old animal. I don't buy it. I, I think it's useful and interesting and it helps coordinate things. I could easily understand that. But the, the motives, look at Iran, the motives behind the government and behind the protesters are still very human things. They can coordinate their activities better with technology. You'd be a fool to think otherwise. But that's not what's driving it. If people, you get news reports in the US that it's driven by Twitter. You'd have to have a brain like Twitter to think that. <laughs> really, it's, of course it's, it's driven by deep historical causes, deep political causes. Coordinate, now the protests are coordinated, but that's not the first lens I would look at it. But again, you could have other, have other speakers who are more friendly to those ideas than me. <laughs> Sir, of the fellow behind you. I was thinking about measuring technology and getting any thoughts on how you might, a firm's organization might reduce that risk of increasing the quality of measuring the quality of human activity. Is there Well, once again, that's a very good question. Increase the quality or reduce the risk of knowledge. Open it up. Have it more democratized. I mean, again, layman with the whole, you could have much greater 20 people at a financial service firm are going to come out with a better answer than one if they have skin in the game. You know, read that book, The Wisdom of Crowds, which sums up a lot of behavioral economics. You know that book? It's, it's, well, it's certainly available in English. It's, it's available here in, um, here in Ireland. This was started by Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, who was the sort of father of statistics. And he, he, there used to be, some of you probably know this, there used to be contests at country fairs where farmers had to guess the weight of a bull. There'd be a big bull, and you'd write down a number, and you'd win, a pa you'd put in a few shillings, and you'd, if you got the closest amount, you'd win. Probably still have them here. Not, not in Galway, but in the countryside. It turned out Galton, who was a real genius, found even if no one person got the exact weight, when you averaged in the weight, you always got the exact weight. Always, always got the exact number. Because it wasn't random. All these farmers had some sense of how fat that bull was. So it wasn't like asking me. And this is called the wisdom of crowds. If you have people with an interest in a subject, not randomly, who work for a firm, and you get their opinion, you allow for their opinion and incorporate, you're going to get a right answer. Not, not about the future, there is no right, but you're much more likely to reduce risk. Much more likely. If you open things up, there's Nobel Prizes in economics have been given and will be given on this thing called behavioral economics, which takes into account a lot of this. So open things up. Listen to the people who work for you. But, sorry, that fellow behind you had a question. Yeah. I want to pick up this issue of democratization of knowledge that is the backbone of religion. I wonder is, is, is there a true democracy in knowledge creation? Um, I can give you several examples. One classic example, since I'm an economist by training, I would, I, would, I would say that the way economic theory has grown, we have seen in the past 60, 70 years, there was a couple of thousand schools at yes. different points in time. And it is the underlying power structure in the knowledge creation yes. which was dictating the, right. the knowledge processes and knowledge uh, networks. And yeah. in fact, the guy, uh, the Nobelar, uh, Bob Lucas, yeah. in 1972, published a paper in 72, and he got the Nobel right Prize later. It, it, it took him three years to get into the jungle. See, his ideas were not recognized prior. 
up to a certain point where it's recognized that, okay, these ideas could be, you know, feasible. You know, we're talking here about knowledge, not truth. Let, let me emphasize something. If we were talking about the truth, if, if you made a discovery in physics that was true, eventually the world would recognize it. It might take a while, but something that, that not, economics is a social structure, it, it, as is any discipline. And it has its own power laws. It has its own laws of dominance and paradigm development. So you're absolutely right. I'm not. However, it's reasonably democratic in that, let's say you and I write a paper on a behavioral economics. For years and years, the model of economics, and something I didn't know about that, is you know, neo, neoclassical equilibrium economics. It turns out it's not true. It's, it's sort of worthless. It's not a true thing. But it helps sway them. 30 years, 40 years. It turns out though that it's beginning to move. I know people now, it's shifted. It took a while, it's not simple, but people now reckon, given the crisis we're having too, that it's worthless. But you're right, it's not a sit down. If you write a paper in math, then it's true. If you solve our math class equation, people tell me you did it. But other subjects, but in organizations, you know, that, no, but, 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 okay, let's look at, for instance, mathematics. Yeah, I mean, we have four different branches of mathematics. Right. Why do the person I can focus? Right. It's because of you know the military and the research and development. Yes. Accident development, I would call that the digital computers. Yes. That's and right. the matching mathematical language of digital computers called real analysis, which got us locked into this massive phase of you know, capitalist growth. And if anybody who does anything outside of real analysis, he's he's not a part of knowledge creation in this. Well, yes and no. Now, I, I hear what you're saying. I agree with you, by the way. I don't disagree. I would say that it's not, when you're dealing with knowledge domains like this, it's not a pure democracy. It's a representative democracy. Well, you're washed away by average. It is washed away by average, but it's still better than a dictatorship. Imagine if economics, you know, someone like Lucas or someone like that, I am economics. That's what you get in first. At least you can't argue back if you can go to the American economy. I've seen people argue back. There is, it's somewhat representative rather than a, it's a, a pure autocracy as you would find in should we merge with, you know, should we buy this firm. But you're right. It's, rep, it's a representative democracy. It's not a pure one. There are, I don't know what a pure knowledge democracy would look like. Was, that would be a real hard one. Even in my own family, my brothers, you know, people would outweigh you. <laughs> it's true, though. It's a good point to make. You know, if there's a lot of interesting writing on that subject. It's a good subject to go into. One of the things I don't have time to talk to you about was knowledge about knowledge. One of the things in the future of knowledge is we're going to have to learn more about the subject, how it works, how dominance is achieved, how paradigmatic dominance works. So we need to know how people learn. It's still, we are in the infancy of how people learn. What sorts of knowledge are there? How do you categorize now? Know-how, direct knowledge, intuition, analytic knowledge. How do you categorize this? What's its relationship with judgment? What's its relationship with wisdom? It's all in the infancy. So not meta-knowledge, knowledge about knowledge is a hot subject. We have time for, what do you think, one or two more questions? Yeah, um... I'd like to pick up on this notion of democratization as well. If, if you think of democratization as perhaps a shift in growth of power, I would take wider society probably is our best example of that phenomenon actually yes. taking place. Yeah, I think so. You know, democratization of wider society took place um, by the forced removal of power from the elites who actually controlled it. I think the French Revolution perhaps the years, for example. Now, that took place mass protest and obviously violence can actually be as well. Is that what you think is that an organization? No, I think you can find other it's a counter example. I mean within organizations or countries. That's just one sentence. But let's say within uh, let me give you I'm talking about kind of the idea of power and right. how power was never relinquished. Yeah. It's very hard to find examples of power being relinquished. You know, you're absolutely right. Let me give you a let me give you a counter example, though I tend to think that's true. Let's look talk about Brazil. Brazil is becoming, I go there, I work for Petrobras as a client. Brazil is becoming a real democratic country. After many years, and I don't know what the, maybe it'll revert, 
But today, it's, a demo, it's as democratic as most countries are. So it's becoming, without a lot of violence. Now we have huge inequalities there. They have a lot of problems, deep problems, but they're working on them. And it's possible they'll evolve into a reasonably democratic country from something that isn't. More interesting, or equally interesting, I saw something there I never saw before that really turned me on. It was great to see it. They have, a, I'd say, a democratic, popular culture. People call each other by their first name. Have any of you been to Brazil? Great food, gorgeous women. Oh, I may be incorrect to say that, but great beaches and great music. So I go to Brazil and I went to the, you know the HSBC Bank, Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank? I, I was invited to give a talk there. Biggest bank in Brazil, right? They told me that the CEO of that bank, every morning blogs, he writes a quick blog, whatever's on his mind, what's going on in the world that affects the bank, and everyone reads it and responds back, and he responds back to them every morning. Two hours, the entire bank have a discussion. Could you believe, I, I, I actually didn't believe it. Yeah, I had the same thing, I said, oh, come on, I don't believe it. So I came the next morning to the bank, I said, I want to see this. Now, I can't read Portuguese, but I read Spanish enough. I could sort of figure it out. Sergio, he used his first name, gets on and talked about some things he read in the newspaper and stuff that's going on. And people would write back, sometimes fairly aggressively. One guy said, this is crap. I don't believe it. Write to the, the CIA and he responded, you wait and see. Come, come back in three months and I'll apologize if, it's, if it is crap. Two hours. Now, that's... I know it's a, one example, but it's a big bank in a big country. So stuff like that is going on. Now, it's not the norm, but there are places in the world that's changing. So I use that as a counterexample of nonviolent uh, democratization. <laughs> Although I probably tend to agree with you. Very few people give up power or prestige without a fight. But he did. Maybe he's not made. And you know, there's also in Japan, to use another place, what percentage, of, you know the firm Honda? Any of you own Hondas? Do they cars sell well here? Pretty common car, right? They're not dying, you don't have to bail them out, they do pretty well. The man who runs Honda, the CEO, his salary is about 30 times the sal salary of the janitor at Honda. But third, it's in that constitution. He earns about 30 times more than the guy who sweeps up the floor. We have a firm, General Motors, where the guy who ran it into the ground earned 780 times what the janitor earned. So maybe Japan's on to a little in terms of democratization, at least of outcomes, in terms of how they're paid. I think there are green signs of some of this happening. I like to think so, but I think there are. I think there are. Those well, I think you wouldn't want to work for them. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if you work for a firm, now some people don't mind because they think they're going to end up on top. That's, that's the game they play. But a lot of people are catching on that this is really, what do I want to do? This All the money flows to you know, five or six people. I'm never going to be one of them. Yeah, and if someone offers you, I would think there's going to be a huge movement to a stock ownership of employees, cooperative, different models. Not necessarily not capitalistic, but different models of management and ownership and structure that will tend to acquire people, who, the sort of people you want to work for you anyway. I mean, the standard model, you can rise to the top by stepping over people and then you can loot the firm. Doesn't really, I think it's pretty unappealing to a lot of people. So yeah, I think, and I think there are countries that's very, Japan, no one would think that way. And it gives them a real advantage. Certainly the coming century will be heavily dominated by China. I don't think the, I, now I'm not a Sinologist, I'm really not, but I don't think the Chinese find those models that appealing. They were very co given the, the history of the country. They have different sort of models. I think, I tend to think, I could be wrong, I could eat these words, that the Anglo-American model of rabid individualism is over. You're seeing its death throes to, in, as we speak. That's where you It's a really good book about spirit level. It's a, yeah, it's about inequality. Right, someone just told me last night about it. They seem happier. So, on the other hand, do you ever look at the happiness? Yeah, but if you look at happiness levels, this is really odd. That some very terrible countries are very happy. 
which deep inequality. Do you know what usually the number one country for happiness is? Bhutan. Bhutan. He's studying it. Yeah, but Nigeria is in the top three, and it, it's very unequal. I know. You go to Black Africa. Some the people are quite, they're not that unhappy, although the countries are awful in some regards. It's a very uh, the U.S. is the richest, and it's not happy. So clearly, you can make that case. But those are interesting. I did read that book. It was an interesting. But I think that for reasons of more pragmatic economics, that the type of organizations based on these models, I think they're done. They may not know they're done, and they may not die tomorrow, but um, I think they're finished. They, the schools don't know that yet, and they don't know it yet, but I think, I think it's more or less done. They, can't, they won't be able to attract people. I mean, you can keep going the same way you could keep going using feudal mechanisms, a feudal, there are countries that are still, Saudi Arabia is still going, wealth can keep it propped up as a feudal country. But I think more or less for our purposes, it's sort of over, I think it's over. Maybe not in Australia. They may keep it going. So I think we have to go now. Thank you very much.